During my early years as a hunter, I received a notice from an old colleague about an abandoned house outside New York City limits. The place had stood empty, deserted for decades. Only recently had it begun to emit a foul odor. Stranger still, nobody ever saw anyone or anything come or go from the house. Initially, people speculated that an animal had found its way in and died. But the odor lingered for weeks, then months. A few locals braved the old house days before and haven't been seen since. People started feeling uneasy, and darker rumors began swirling about the old home. This was no ordinary situation. It reeked of something sinister, something that lay in my realm of expertise. Before the situation worsened, I decided to take a look myself. That evening, I grabbed my tools and headed into the desolate home. The smell was overwhelming seeping into the very foundations of the building. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary for an old home at first. The place was littered with remnants of a lifelong abandoned. Dusty furniture lay covered in cobwebs, and faded portraits stared down from the walls, their eyes seeming to follow my every move. I explored most of the house, checking for anything out of the ordinary, until I came across the door to the basement. The odor here was the most foul, a dank heat oozing from every crack. Stepping inside, I was immediately struck by an eerie, unnatural silence. The world outside seemingly disappeared. My flashlight could barely pierce the fog-like darkness that now enveloped me as it shined down the stairway. I tightened my grip on my pistol and took my first step down the stairs. The only sounds I could hear were the creaking of the steps, barely audible over the racing of my heart. My senses screamed at me, begging me to turn and run. If I left now, countless others could be in danger. I had no choice but to trudge forward. A cacophony of sensations instantly overwhelmed me. A putrid, acidic stench lingered over it all. The walls around me, they were alive. A grotesque tapestry of flesh and bone. They writhed and contorted in agony, a silent scream etched into every inch of their being. Faces, human faces, were melded into the walls, their expressions twisted in eternal torment. Their haunting eyes followed me, pleading for an end to their indescribable suffering. What sort of monster could do this? Then, across the room, a tall, gaunt figure emerged from the floor. A nightmare made flesh, its body a shifting mosaic of skin and bone, with cold eyes, calculating, watching my every move. An apex predator, it bowed with almost beautiful grace, and then it spoke. Greetings, honored guest. I ran. I'm ashamed to admit it, but I ran away. It was the first and last time in my life that I abandoned duty for self-preservation, and was my first foray into the raw terror of a Zimishi. Fellow hunters, our hunt demands that we know everything about these creatures down to the last detail. I will share all that I have gathered over my lifetime, and as you come to learn and understand these monsters, you must do the same. Together, we shall pierce the veil of darkness that hides these malevolent creatures and fulfill our solemn vow to cast them out into the light. As with all clans, we must trace back their origins to the root from which their power and nature spring. The Zamishi hail from a member of the third generation known as the Antediluvians, powerful godlike figures. The Zamishi Antediluvian, better known simply as the eldest, is the progenitor of all Zamishi kind. Many deem it the most monstrous and inhuman of the third generation, a being so far removed from humanity that it's almost beyond comprehension. Its beginnings trace back to the city of Enoch, ruled by the first vampires under the watchful eye of Cain himself. Here, Enoch the Wise, the first of Cain's children, was tormented by the darkness within him. He saw his vampiric nature as a curse, a source of evil and chaos. Desperate to rid himself of the beast, he would expel his wickedness, creating a black primordial mass which he fused with a mortal, a seer and magician. To Enoch's surprise, the mortal did not die. Rather, it seemed unchanged at all. Intrigued, Enoch embraced the mortal, transforming him into the Zemishi Antediluvian. The mass of wickedness was indeed Enoch's distilled vampiric nature, and upon fusing with the mortal, 
Enoch's beast was granted a physical form. Some believe that when the mortal was embraced, a second beast emerged, making him much more ravenous and twisted than any of its kind. However, Enoch's beast, while terrible, also granted the antediluvian unexpected boons, like intuition, imagination, and the need to evolve, all hallmarks of the Zimishi clan. The eldest would largely stay away and despise its fellow antediluvians, perceiving them as stagnant, trapped in the shadows of their creators. It believed that this unwillingness to change would be their undoing, and that humanity's relentless innovation would eventually eclipse them. To prevent this, it became consumed by an unyielding impulse to change, to evolve, becoming a master of the art of flesh crafting, freely manipulating bone and sinew as if they were mere clay, a gift given to him by Enoch's wickedness. It would constantly alter its form in an endless quest for perfection. Many believe that Arakel, the Toreador antediluvian, would ask the eldest to give her ethereal beauty and elegance. And it is said that Cain used the eldest's gifts to transform Absimiliard, the Nosferatu antediluvian, into a grotesque monstrosity that many of us know today. However, this mastery over flesh would have a price. The blood of mortals or animals barely sustained the Zemishi antediluvian. Instead, it yearned for the vitae of its kind, a hunger that grew more intense with each passing day. The eldest foresaw a grim future. Its insatiable thirst would lead to the destruction of its kind and, ultimately, itself. Tormented by this prophecy, it hid away from the world. Desperate for a way to cull the ravenous beasts that dwelled within, the eldest delved into ancient knowledge, searching for a way to transcend its nature. Again and again it reshaped its form, seeking an escape from the beasts within. Yet, as the decades turned to centuries, its hunger only grew. Disheartened by the futile search, and increasingly disillusioned with its unimaginative kin and their petty politics, the eldest abandoned the first city, convinced that the answers it sought lay in the mortal world. The Zimishi antediluvian wandered the earth, using its mortal life gifts as an oracle to lead the way, venturing east to what is now known as India. There it would meet a man named Kartariria, whom it embraced. The eldest allowed Kartariria freedom, uninterested in typical sire-child relations. Kartariria was not embraced out of loneliness or any mortal emotion, but rather curiosity. The eldest would discover it could share the senses of its progeny, becoming a sort of pseudo-hive mind, inhabiting any of its offspring and gleaning their knowledge and experience. This allowed it to explore even more forms of adaptation, furthering its quest. In turn, the eldest shared a piece of its flesh with each child, giving them the art of flesh crafting that would define the Zamishi clan and become known as the Discipline Vicissitude. This gift, however, was also a curse. In the Middle East, the eldest embraced a tribal leader, Galad, using him as its eyes for the region. Decades later, the antediluvian would find itself starved for vitae and frenzied for the first time in its life. It lost control and emerged from within Galad, who was thousands of miles away, devouring him from the inside out. It would learn a grim reality. If it were ever to frenzy again, it could potentially destroy its entire clan, ruining any progress its children could have on finding the ultimate form and exposing itself to unnecessary risks. Understand this, Hunters. Should something similar happen today, the potential chaos it could wreck would be unimaginable. Heed my warning. Their antediluvian can emerge from any of its offspring at any time. All Zemishi are but Trojan horses for their progenitor, ticking time bombs waiting to go off sooner rather than later. To prevent the further loss of its progeny, the Eldest began to gather tribes of mortals during its wanderings to secure a constant supply of vitae embracing those who shared its restless spirit, surging its ranks. Eventually, the antediluvian felt a strange pull to a place within Eastern Europe, the Carpathian Mountains. Something called to it, too alluring for the antediluvian to ignore. With its newly formed clan, the eldest would settle within the mountains. Soon the clan's influence spread throughout Europe, uncontested by other vampires still flourishing within the first city. But this territory wasn't without its challenges. 
the lupines, werewolves, contested their dominance, battling for control of the forests and mountains. During this conflict, the call of the mountains grew stronger within the eldest. A voice whispered to it in its sleep, drawing the antediluvian deeper into the Carpathians. The eldest became obsessed with the voice, spending all of its time trying to communicate with the spirit. When it did, the spirit told the eldest its name, Kupala. Kupala was a force of nature, corrupting all it touched. An entity believed to have existed since the dawn of humanity, even when Cain was young. This demon had long been at odds with the werewolves, eventually entrapped by their most powerful shamans. They would create the Carpathian Mountains with their gifts, ripping the earth apart and slamming it back together, imprisoning the great demon. There it remained, whispering promises of power and ancient knowledge to those who might free it. Now aware of the eldest and its progeny, the demon proposed a pact. In return for aiding the clan against the werewolves, the antediluvian would break Kupala's ancient chains. The eldest became engrossed in Kupala's teachings, uncovering ancient magics once thought beyond the reach of vampiric kind. This magic would later be known as Kuldunic sorcery, a potent and ancient form of sorcery and one of the clan's hallmark powers. The werewolves fiercely resisted Kupala's release, leading to a major battle in the cavern where Kupala was trapped. Great werewolf champions, powerful Methuselahs, and ghoul abominations fought to the death in a desperate effort to get to the demon. Ultimately, the Zemishi triumphed, and Kupala was freed, but it remained bound to the Carpathians. Kupala claimed the mountains as its new domain, sharing its existence with the Zemishi. The tribes of the werewolves would never recover from this loss. Their sacred territory slowly corrupted, pushing them further and further from the land they had safeguarded for generations. For centuries, the Zemishi flourished. Unchallenged, their reign endured until the cataclysmic flood, where the Almighty punished the world. The survivors, desperate and displaced, sought refuge in the highlands. The Zemishi's mountain havens transformed into islands, becoming a sanctuary for these refugees. Here, the clan asserted their dominance, demanding a tribute from each family, often the youngest child, for purposes of vitae, experimentation, or servitude. In some instances, particularly among larger tribes, entire families were claimed by the more demanding rulers. These sacrifices sowed the seeds for the creation of the unique Zemishi ghouls, known as revenants. During this time, the Zemishi found themselves particularly intrigued by the nature of ghouls, mortals who had tasted vampire vitae but had not been embraced. These Zemishi began experimenting on their ghouls, leading to a discovery. The traits of ghouls could be passed down to their offspring. Through meticulous and often cruel breeding programs spanning several generations, a unique lineage known as revenants were created. Unlike typical ghouls, Revenants were born with the ability to naturally produce a weak form of vampiric vitae, sustaining their bodies without the need for constant vampire blood. This inherent ability marked a significant evolution, making revenants more resilient, aging at a fraction of the rate of ordinary mortals. Furthermore, revenants exhibited the capacity to learn vampire disciplines, albeit in a diminished form. Recognizing the potential of these beings, the Zemishi began to cultivate revenant families, breeding them en masse. These families, over time, came to view their Zemishi masters as deities, their loyalty unshakable, making them ideal candidates for eventual transformation into full vampires. Centuries of inbreeding and the continuous infusion of vampiric blood gradually morphed these revenants into a distinct class of supernatural beings. They evolved to exist independently from their creators, their unique traits setting them apart in the complex hierarchy of the night. There are quite a number of different revenant families, each with distinct abilities, personalities, and histories, a topic that we will delve into later. As the tides fell, the Zemishi's grip over Europe waned as mortals and fellow vampires eagerly seized the new territories. Notably, the clan Nosferatu and Gangrel from Enoch emerged as prominent forces. For millennia, these clans had remained largely ignorant of the Zemishi, due to the latter's absence from the first city, believing that all mortals originated from Enoch. 
These clans felt entitled to traverse the world as they pleased. However, the Zamishi dealt with these intruders ruthlessly, both vampires and mortals alike. They marked their borders with grotesque displays, forests of bodies impaled on bone trees and messengers, grotesquely altered by vicissitude, sent back to their masters as a warning and display of Zimishi might. Despite their efforts, the sheer numbers of these interlopers proved overwhelming, and the Zamishi reluctantly permitted passage through their lands. In time, other clans began to acknowledge the Zamishi's claims over the domains of Eastern Europe, and a semblance of calm appeared to settle over the clan. However, this peace was but fleeting, as Cain's wrath turned vampire kind upside down. Cain would curse the Zamishi to be deeply entwined with their possessions, be it their land, people, or even abstract concepts, forcing them to carry their bonded possession with them wherever they go. Those who neglected these bonds found themselves facing death. The Zamishi Antediluvian itself nearly perished on its journey back to its birthplace due to the power of this curse. As more vampires and mortals fled from Enoch, terrified of Cain's anger, they encroached upon Zamishi territory once again. Instead of presenting a united front against this new threat, the clan members retreated, isolating themselves within their domains. They became known as tyrants and fiends, ruling their mortal populations through displays of power and fear. Many continued their macabre experimentation of flesh crafting, further enhancing their isolation from the rest of the world. While many perished in these tumultuous times, those who survived would significantly influence the future direction and character of the Zamishi clan. In the time following the Great Flood, the Salubri clan, known for their healing abilities, would split, creating a new faction, the warrior caste led by the Salubri Methuselah Samiel. This group of warriors embarked on a crusade targeting demonic entities, specifically focusing on the Bali, a sect of demon-worshipping vampires in its infancy. However, their attention soon turned towards the Zamishi, particularly due to the clan's antediluvian and its pact with the demon Kupala. Samiel rallied his warriors and ventured into the Carpathian Mountains, targeting Zamishi strongholds in a relentless search for their antediluvian. As they clashed with the Zamishi and their grotesque creations, these encounters only reinforced the Salubri's belief in the Zamishi's demonic nature, mistaking the monstrous beings for actual demons. The crusade culminated in a fierce assault on the Antediluvian's castle. Samuel and his knights breached the stronghold, facing the ancient vampire directly. The ensuing battle was brutal. The eldest, ever adaptable, shifted into a myriad of monstrous forms, each more terrifying than the last, decimating most of Samuel's forces. Samuel, undeterred, charged forward, his sword ablaze with heavenly fire. As they clashed, the very foundations of the earth shook. Despite the antediluvian's formidable and ever-changing forms, Samuel proved to be the superior combatant. He evaded a vicious attack from the antediluvian and pierced its monstrous body. It howled in agony and in a blind rage seized Samuel, tearing apart his skull from the inside out with its flesh-crafting prowess, even as the eldest collapsed itself. There are a number of accounts on the validity of Samuel's death that day with many claiming that he lived the ordeal and would die later in life during the Second Bali Wars. However, sadly for the Salubri and the rest of the world, the Eldest did not die, for it cannot. As long as any of its progeny lived, the Antediluvian will persist within them. It manifested in one of its most powerful offspring, known as Draken, who nurtured and eventually transferred the Antediluvian's essence to Yorak, another of the Eldest's progeny, hidden deep within the Carpathians. The eldest would remain in torpor for many centuries. During this time, it was exposed to the insidious whispers of Kupala once more. This prolonged interaction profoundly impacted the Zamishi, significantly enhancing their mastery of Koldunic sorcery. The corrupted soil and vegetation of the region, steeped in Kupala's essence, facilitated this dark evolution into magical prowess. As the use of Kuldonic sorcery grew, some Zimishi chose to renounce the use of Kupala's magic, understanding that this power originated not from their progenitor, but from an ancient corrupting force far out of their control. As the progenitor of the Zimishi sank deeper into its torpor, 
the clan would become increasingly more isolated. Individually, they thrived, becoming godlike figures in the eyes of their subjects. However, this self-imposed exile came at a steep cost, as they gradually lost territories to rival clans, neglecting the intricate dance of politics and dominion that defined vampire society. During this time, a figure rose to prominence within the clan. Yorak, one of the eldest's original progeny, becoming the head of the Voivodate, a loose group of Zemishi domains within the Carpathians. Yorak's ascent to leadership was not driven by a desire to guide or unite the clan towards a common goal. Instead, his position afforded him the convenience of subjugating mortal tribes within the Zemishi domains with greater ease. Like the eldest, Yorick was consumed by an obsession to achieve what he termed Aji Dahaka, an exalted state of existence liberated from the primal constraints of the beast within, only obtainable through the powers of vicissitude, and has become the goal of those who partake in the path of metamorphosis. Yorick devoted countless lifetimes to his quest, secluding himself in the remote depths of the Carpathian Mountains. It was here, Amidst the echoing whispers of Kapala that Yorak's dedication to his dark craft reached its zenith. Engrossed in his relentless experimentation, he forged his most horrifying creation, a testament to his twisted genius, the Cathedral of Flesh. This cathedral was not a mere assemblage of flesh and bone. No, it was alive, a vessel embodying a collective screaming consciousness of the countless souls trapped within its walls. To call it a nightmare would be an understatement. It defied natural order. Were it not such a blasphemous and evil thing, one could appreciate the macabre ingenuity. Massive stalagmite-like pillars supported the cathedral, created from an amalgamation of rock and bone. It writhed and twisted as if in constant agony. The walls were a mosaic of horror. Skulls with eyes and surrounding muscles still eerily intact were embedded into the structure. They were not mere decorations. These eyes were kept moist by scores of ghouls, ensuring that they could blink. In places where skulls were not used, the walls were made of translucent cartilage, so thin that one could see the ghastly sea of viscera and floating organs behind them, creating a living, breathing tapestry of flesh. Revenants performed their grim duties with a morbid dedication. They were engaged in ritual tattooing, a horrifying practice where they used bone needles to thread charcoal-dusted lines through the skin of their victims, marking them eternally as part of this living nightmare. It is said that the cathedral walls sang a haunting song, both a warning to the mortal sacrifices and a welcome to its Zemishi guest. In these modern nights, the Cathedral of Flesh has long since disappeared, with only a large gaping hole at its origin. What happened to it and where it has gone is largely unknown. But we shall discuss this topic later. The Zemishi would begin to take interest in the rise of the Romans, becoming increasingly aware that the Empire's growth was not just a result of human endeavor, but was significantly influenced by vampire politics. With Rome expanding closer to Zemishi lands, the threat became too significant to ignore. Yorick was one of the first to recognize this looming danger. He understood that various vampire clans craved the territories under Zemishi control due to the immense power Kupala gave the clan. Lacking the skills or interest in direct political maneuvering, he chose a different approach. Yorak began to embrace influential and savvy mortals into the clan. One such individual was Shah Agra, a powerful Slavic shaman from the Vroy tribe. Yorak was drawn to her potent magic and leadership abilities, seeing her as a valuable addition to the clan. She would prove invaluable at establishing domains of influence outside Zemishi territory. After Shah Agra, many clan members began to embrace politically astute individuals who could bolster the clan's influence against rivals like the Ventru or La Sambra. As the early Christian era dawned, a pivotal opportunity presented itself. The collapse of the Hunnic Empire led to a ripple effect turning its people into nomads who began to migrate westward, encroaching on the lands of the Ostrogoths and Visigoths. These tribes, seeking refuge, turned to Rome and Emperor Valens, asking for settlement in Moesia. The Romans' harsh demands, the surrender of their women and children as slaves and their weapons, 
were intolerable to these proud martial races, sparking a rebellion that would eventually lead to a significant Roman defeat. This decline of Rome, coupled with the loss of control by its shadowy vampiric rulers, primarily the Ventru, Toreador, and Malkavians, presented a golden opportunity for the Zemishi. Yorak, seizing the moment, quickly negotiated with the local Gangrel. In exchange for safe passage through the Carpathians, the Gangrel agreed to assist in attacking Roman settlements. The isolated clan had its first taste of victory in centuries, and the rise in power of the elders began to sow the seeds of hatred in the clan's younger members. This daring move would come at an immense cost. Their rapid expansion and unexpected adeptness in political maneuvering had alarmed several other clans, sparking widespread conflict. The Tremir, long-standing adversaries of the Zemishi, ignited a war over the Carpathians, driven by their desire to seize the powers of Kupala. At the same time, the Ventru began to undermine the Zemishi's influence. They launched a series of political countermeasures, effectively reducing the Zemishi-controlled domains in the region. Meanwhile, the Nosferatu engaged in a more clandestine form of warfare. They erected a network of castles across the Carpathians, not as mere strongholds, but as a magical barrier to trap and weaken Kupala. As these external pressures mounted, internal discord fractured the Zemishi's unity. Many Zemishi lords prioritized the safety of their own lands and retreated to their domains. This weakened the collective front of the clan, leaving them vulnerable to their adversaries' advances. The spread of Christianity added another layer of complexity to the Zemishi's plight. It challenged their long-standing reliance on pagan-based magic and undermined their authority. While the Zemishi's religious influence dwindled, other clans thrived, quickly adapting to the times and leveraging the church's growing influence for their benefit, further isolating the Zemishi. The Mongol invasion of Europe in 1241 was yet another blow. The turmoil and destruction brought about by the invasion led to the loss of many Zemishi and assets, further weakening their hold. In the midst of this chaos, a figure emerged from within the Zemishi ranks, Lugol. He despised the Elder's rule and the oppressive blood bonds enslaving him and his brethren. Lugol sought change. He would search the Carpathian landscape for an artifact known as Kupala's Sacred Flower rumored to have the power to break blood oaths. Upon finding it, Lugos liberated himself and began freeing his allies. With his allies free and his strength rising, Lugos was poised to push back against his tyrannical masters. The Anarch Revolt unfolded with surprising ease for the Zemishi Anarchs, particularly when compared to the struggles faced by many other clans. The Zemishi, inherently disorganized and lacking cohesion, were much easier to attack than the unified front many other clans faced. Lugos, who came to be known as the Bloodbreaker, played a pivotal role in this upheaval. Armed with the knowledge and power to break blood bonds, he swiftly bolstered his forces, storming Carpathian strongholds and destabilizing Eastern Europe more effectively than any external force had managed. Lugos would quickly ascend to the fifth generation, consuming his elders and gaining their power. Emboldened, he launched an audacious assault on a Methuselah stronghold, targeting Bielobog, known in his domain as the White God. Bielobog was said to be one of the wildest of the eldest's progeny and was renowned for his mastery over Koldunic sorcery. He had the unique ability to flake his skin and use it like a weapon, which was used to great advantage in the foggy winterlands that he ruled, hence his name. However, Bielobog's defenses were compromised following an altercation with the Teutonic Knights, who invaded Eastern Europe. A betrayal by one of his revenant ghouls led the Knights into his domain. Although he managed to fend off the assailants, he sustained severe injuries. Lugos seized this moment, and the ensuing battle was brutal. Ultimately, Lugos emerged victorious, consuming the Methuselah and ascending in rank. However, this quick ascension up the generational ladder also emboldened his arrogance. Following the defeat of the White God, he set his sights on the Eldest. The Anarch movement was gaining momentum, capturing weaker Zemishi and forcing them to join their ranks or face destruction. Sensing the imminent threat, the Eldest summoned all remaining progeny for defense. However, when the Anarchs arrived, the Eldest fled, 
abandoning its offspring to their fate. Among those left behind was Lambak, a Methuselah known for lacking confidence or courage, an anomaly within the Zimishi clan. Lambak put up a feeble resistance before being captured by the Anarchs. Swiftly aligning with them, he revealed the location of the eldest in exchange for having his bonds broken by Lugos. The Anarchs, led by Lugos and Lambak, stormed Cernog Monastery, an ancient cathedral where the eldest lay in torpor. Lugos would be the first to enter, swiftly defeating the eldest's guardians. The Anarchs dismantled the magical protections and unearthed the slumbering vampire. In his greed, Lugos consumed the antediluvian, attempting to seize control of the clan. However, something was off. Lambak knew his sire was not this weak. He studied the body before realizing the truth. The real eldest had not been defeated. Instead, it had assumed Lugos's guise using its mastery of fleshcrafting. The real Lugos had been killed by the eldest the moment he entered the building, his face shaped into that of one of the eldest's guards. The disguised eldest then proclaimed that he would go into torpor and return during Gehenna, the end times for vampire kind, and the Zemishi would rule over all. Lambach was too terrified to tell anyone at the time of the deception, and by the time he did, no one believed him, becoming the laughing stock of the clan. Despite his ancient power, Lambach is a figure consumed by fear, a shadow of what one might expect from such an age-old being. I had encountered him on the East Coast a few years back. It was a pitiful sight, a creature who seemed to have abandoned all hope. Perhaps this desolation led him to confide in me, or perhaps he just wanted someone to talk to, someone who would listen. He spoke of the eldest, after it had faked its death. It would fall into a deep torpor. The eldest's body was covertly transported across the ocean to a secluded crypt beneath what is now New York City. There, it underwent a profound metamorphosis, dissolving into the very earth, continuing its search for the perfect form. In this process, it expanded, engulfing everything within its reach, as a civilization unknowingly thrived above it. Lambach was drawn into the depths of New York by the Eldest's followers, lured to join this entity in its quest to become one with all. The horror of what lay beneath the city's bustling streets drove him to flee, desperate to warn anyone who would listen of the looming threat. Yet his warnings were met with scorn. The Eldest sent out a call that resonated through its clan drawing them into the sewers of New York to reclaim and merge with its essence. Lambach now believes the eldest has begun infusing itself into the very fabric of life. Plants, animals, people, the very earth becoming a pseudo-mycelial network spreading its roots for miles, aiming to master and unify all creation under its will. Facing such a relentless and omnipotent force leaves us with grim prospects. However, I refuse to simply watch as this entity threatens to engulf our world. The urgency to act is paramount. We must spread the word, alert anyone willing to listen about the monstrosity lurking beneath New York, and rally together to confront this menace. Around the same time as the supposed death of the Eldest, the First Inquisition would begin hunting vampires, turning the tables for the first time in history. With no unified front to protect them, many vampires fell victim. In response, the Camarilla was formed, alongside the Convention of Thorns, where most Anarchs conceded to the Camarilla's rule. The Zemishi and La Sombra were left out of these developments and faced the rising prominence of the Tremere within the Camarilla, as well as the Inquisition looming at their doorstep, realizing the need for a response to avoid becoming targets themselves. Prominent Zemishi and La Sombra leaders convened on the island of Mallorca. There, they would lay the groundwork for a sect of their own, the Sabbat. The early days of the Sabbat were fueled by their hatred of the Camarilla, believing them tyrannical overlords, a sentiment still held to this day. This sentiment of defiance was not just a whisper among the young. It echoed through the ranks, attracting even formidable figures like Vladimir Rustovich, a Zemishi Methuselah of considerable power. Rustovich, along with other of elders, primarily joined the Sabbat for their own intricate designs, yet their allegiance gave considerable legitimacy to the Sabbat, elevating it to a formidable rival of the Camarilla. The battle between the elders and Sabbat would subside as many would join the sect, 
or remain neutral in exchange for resources. This distinction between old and young clan members would cause a split and give rise to the old clan Zimishi. As the name suggests, the old clan comprised ancient Zimishi who did not join the Sabbat and those who did not practice the art of flesh crafting. Many elders have renounced the discipline due to its association with their progenitor and its ability to control all who use vicissitude. They believe the main clan are mere vessels for the eldest, not individuals. This can be seen in their interactions with non-old clan Zimishi, talking at them rather than to them, as they regard any interactions as direct communication to the antediluvian. Their organization is mostly content with being left alone to experiment within their domains. This has proven a boon to the Sabbat and the old clan, as neither can afford confrontation. Most of the Sabbat's structure and cohesion were largely run by the La Sombra. Being more adept at political maneuvering and logistics, they were suited for the leadership role. Instead, the Zamishi guided the sect in a spiritual aspect. They incorporated practices like the mass embrace and rites of creation, a ritual that vampires undertake in order to become true members within the Sabbat rather than mere pawns. In addition, the Zamishi would also develop the paths of enlightenment. Codes of morality that vampires use to stave off their beast, unlike Golconda, a similar code of morality. The paths allow vampires to reject their humanity while still remaining whole and not under the control of their beasts. Their most important addition is the Voldery, a creation devised from their mastery and deep understanding of blood bonds. The Voldery is an essential part of the Sabbat ecosystem a special form of blood bond that breaks any current bonds and binds members to their packs, small groups of vampires used for nearly all functions within the sect. Many believe the sect would remain a disorganized group of anarchs without it. This made the Zimishi indispensable assets to the Sabbat and solidified them as a dominant clan within the sect. Despite the conclusion of the Convention of Thorns, the Sabbat's onslaught against the Camarilla did not cease. While many sieges on Camarilla strongholds were successful, the Camarilla was ultimately superior in their ability to react and control the situation. This relentless aggression eventually led to further territorial losses for the already beleaguered Zimishi. Many fled their ancestral Carpathian strongholds, seeking refuge in Scandinavia. By the dawn of the 17th century, the Zimishi clan had largely abandoned their historic homeland. The Anarch Revolt at the time seemed to be a victory for the Zimishi. However, with the loss of so many influential members and the death of their progenitor, the Zimishi's lands became prime pickings for the Camarilla, particularly the Ventru and the Tremir, whose power far exceeded that of the Zimishi at the time. During the 19th century, the rising conflicts of the mortal world became fertile ground for many Zimishi vampires. As World War II erupted, some Zimishi would pick sides, such as Landulf II, a formidable 9th century black magician. Aligning with Germany, he encouraged their ideologies of racial superiority and occultism, manipulating members of society and turning them into ghouls for his own goals. The conflict itself brought the clan many boons. Hundreds of thousands of fresh bodies lay throughout Europe. These battlefields became their laboratories, where they found an abundance of victims and subjects for their twisted experiments. The rise of Hitler and the subsequent German and Russian military campaigns had a significant impact on the Zimishi during World War II. Initially, the Sabbat Zimishi saw an opportunity in the chaos caused by the Nazi advance and exploited it to attack weakened Camarilla positions. They benefited from Hitler's disdain for aristocracy, which prevented many elder Camarilla from influencing the Nazi regime. However, the Zimishi, often embodying the aristocratic archetype themselves, had to be cautious and conceal their valuable assets and havens from the invading forces. The Russian advance, characterized by relentless artillery bombardments, followed by ground assaults, proved more damaging to the Zimishi. Several ancient keeps and havens were destroyed in this manner, leading to the final death of many Zimishi. Post-war, many found themselves under the rule of Stalin's communist regime. Recognizing the threat posed by this new political landscape, many elders reached out to their kin beyond the Iron Curtain, leading to the formation of the Oradea League. This alliance was a mutual defense pact among Old World Zimishi, designed to ensure autonomy from the Sabbat. Surprisingly, 
The isolationist policies of the Soviet Union inadvertently helped the League by restricting travel and reuniting them with other Russian Zemishi. By the time of the Soviet Union's collapse, the Oradea League had grown stronger, able to resist pressures from the Sabbat, thus securing their place and influence in the changing political landscape. In these modern nights, the once mighty Zemishi clan finds itself in a state of decline, a shadow of its former glory. Their penchant for seclusion has only worsened matters, losing much of their territory to other vampires. The situation has worsened as the eldest summons its progeny for sustenance, causing many of the clan's more formidable members to vanish into the night. Despite this general decline, old clan Zemishi, those untouched by the call of their antediluvian, continue to wield significant power, and as individuals, have proven to be some of the most powerful and influential figures within vampire society. Figures like Mayumi Shibasaki stand as towering examples, her command over Tokyo showcasing that in some corners of the world, the Zemishi still holds sway. The La Sombra's step back from the Sabbat has left the sect rudderless, with most Zemishi showing little interest in assuming leadership. This power vacuum has led some to seek new alliances, with certain clan members defecting to the Camarilla, drawn by promises of protection or personal gain. Meanwhile, the younger, more disenfranchised members have thrown their lot in with the Anarch movement, their ambitions finding no foothold in the traditional domains, prompting them to seek dominion in new, uncharted territories. Those who remain loyal to the Sabbat, however, find themselves in positions of unprecedented power. With little to no competition, many have risen to become archbishops, ruling over vast stretches of land. In these turbulent times, the Zemishi clan, though diminished, continues to adapt and evolve, its members carving out new paths of influence and authority in a world that is ever-changing. As I've said, despite the Zemishi clan's overall decline, on an individual level, numerous Zemishi, both ancient and newly embraced, continue to hold positions of formidable power across the globe. The key to comprehending how these vampires maintain their prestigious status even as their clan's foundations seem to crumble, lies in a deeper exploration of the Zemishi essence. To truly grasp the enduring influence of the Zemishi, we must delve into the core of what defines a Zemishi as Zemishi. Within the ranks of the Sabbat, vampires are known for their ferocity, outstripping many of their Camarilla counterparts in sheer brutality. This stems from their embrace of the beast within and the demanding nature of the Sabbat's objectives, which necessitates a level of savagery not commonly found in other sects. This is especially true for the Zimishi clan, who approach the act of embracing new members with particular discernment. Historically, Zimishi carefully selected their progeny, often embracing from revenant families cultivated over centuries for their desirable traits such as resilience, obedience, and familiarity with the supernatural. In times of conflict, when quick and potent responses are needed, Zemishi would create new vampires directly, subjecting them to a harrowing initiation by burying them alive. This ritual meant to sever ties with their human past and instill the essence of vampiric existence involves the new child fighting their way out of the grave. This ordeal not only tests their strength and will to survive, but often results in a profound psychological transformation. Those who fail to emerge are abandoned, considered too weak to be part of the clan, though this practice is quite rare in modern times. To the Zemishi, most humans are seen as nothing more than malleable material, barely above the status of objects or toys, making attracting a Zemishi's attention nothing short of extraordinary, resulting in a clan composed of remarkably diverse, yet infrequently embraced individuals. This does not just include humans, they frequently embrace non-humans, magi, shamans, and even werewolf kinfolk, with some saying that even the blood of changelings runs in their veins. Other times, Zemishi and the Sabbat will employ what is known as a mass embrace, in which, as the name implies, large groups are embraced all at once, typically with the purpose of becoming cannon fodder thrown at the enemy in waves. Those who survive these ordeals are less likely to be gifted, but rather immensely lucky as survival rates of mass embraces are extremely low. Survivors often become hardened much faster than those around them, fitting into the militant lifestyle of the Sabbat. Like the La Sombra, those embraced by the Zemishi, 
surviving their early years tend to become significantly more formidable than members of other clans due to the harsh and strict standards the clans have on their progeny. The Zamishi embrace differs from other clans. It changes individuals profoundly, stripping away their mortal views and instilling a new monstrous perspective aimed at evolution and power. Even those embraced in the chaos of battle or through less selective means find themselves irrevocably altered, driven by a deep-seated need to transcend their former humanity. This transformation is so intense that it can turn even the most moral beings into entities willing to diablerize their way to supremacy. Oddly enough, though many are ready to diablerize their peers for power, very few choose to diablerize fellow Zemishi. This reluctance may not stem from clan loyalty, but from caution. Masters of vicissitude have the ability to take over the body of their would-be devourers, similar to the eldest's power to control his progeny. While many older, more wizened elders warn of the consequences, many younger Zimishi, especially those within the Sabbat, disregard these cautions, unaware or unconcerned with the deeper clan values and the potential dangers of diablerie. Newly embraced, lucky enough to have caught the eye of their sire, are integrated into a family structure reminiscent of patriarchal or matriarchal systems of older aristocratic traditions. At the heart of these familial dynamics is the Blood Oath, a sacred ritual that forges a bond of loyalty and obedience from the children towards their sire and help curve the immense desire many new vampires have to diablerize. This bond is not merely symbolic, as it is easily exploited by the Regnant, able to manipulate the emotional ties of this bond, reinforcing the sire's dominion over their descendants. Within this complex web of relationships, a fierce competition for the sire's attention and approval emerges among the childer. Each one vies to distinguish themselves within the family hierarchy. For those progeny who have loyally served their voivode across the span of centuries, accruing a significant measure of self-worth to the extent that they might challenge the sire's dominion. There exists the rite of release. This ceremony is a solemn occasion where the achievements of the progeny are recognized, followed by the presentation of freedom. The progeny must then demonstrate the strength of their will to overcome the bond of their blood oath and embrace this liberation. Their sire imparts a mystical benediction figuratively granting the progeny the right to establish their own territory in the wider world. This practice not only facilitates the extension of the Voivode's influence via these new proxy territories, but also alleviates the pressures of rivalry and potential dissent within the Voivode's original jurisdiction. After the ceremony, a festive banquet is held in honor of the occasion, and the progeny is dispatched to a region thoughtfully selected by the sire, aimed at bringing it under their sway. This tradition fosters the creation of a loyal network of vassals throughout the old country, resembling a web of sharp influence, securing the clan's growth and perpetuating the Voivode's legacy. Nonetheless, not every Zimishi experiences such direct mentorship or attention. Those introduced through a mass embrace or other less savory means gain an understanding of their new reality alongside their pack or through the unforgiving environment of Sabbat existence. While these Zimishi could be considered less refined, lacking the cunning their well-groomed kin might have, those who survive thrive due to the clan's innate ruthlessness. The Zimishi clan often proclaims that they are the original creators of the blood bond. Legends credit the eldest with its discovery, even teaching it to Cain himself. Whether it's true or not remains to be seen, However, what we do know is that the Zemishi have honed the skill to a much higher degree than other clans. They are recognized as unparalleled masters in its application, a distinction they have maintained through the ages by wielding it as a formidable instrument of dominion. Their dominion extends over revenants, ghouls, and even their own kin, utilizing the bond as chains of control and influence. Their command over the blood bond transcends mere enslavement. They artfully sculpt the emotions of those bound to them, invoking feelings from intense jealousy to paralyzing fear. Such manipulation reveals their capacity to govern not only the corporeal, but the very hearts and minds of those they ensnare. This profound understanding and manipulation of the blood bond, combined with their arcane knowledge of Koldunic sorcery, 
position the Zamishi as invaluable authorities in all matters concerning its use. Even those within the Camarilla have been known to seek their help in more delicate matters. Within the ranks of vampire clans, none have honed the craft of ghoul creation as masterfully as the Zamishi. Utilizing the formidable powers of vicissitude, they've engineered a myriad of ghoul variants, exclusive and unparalleled. In the Sabbat, where reliance on mortals can be seen as a vulnerability, Zimishi ghouls are pivotal to the sect's dominance. Hellhounds, typically mastiffs or Great Danes transformed into ghouls, are bred for their extraordinary alertness and aggression, safeguarding their domain and master. The Zimishi often employ fleshcrafting to amplify their physical capabilities, granting them larger teeth, enhanced muscles, and even sharper vision and olfactory senses. They have been tended for and are primarily created by the Bratovich Revenant family. They act as guards and pets for high-ranking Sabbat members. Packs are commonly used to track down traitors or those the Sabbat finds unsavory. Schlachta, elite ghouls sculpted through flesh crafting, derive their name from a term meaning nobility, reflecting their superiority over standard ghouls in every way. Whether of human or animal origin, each Slakta undergoes unique modifications, such as the addition of spiked protrusions and armored layers, often achieved by reallocating body fat to shield vital organs and fortifying the skin to serve as natural armor. Enhancements extend to their sensory organs to boost their perceptual abilities, though these alterations can sometimes result in insanity or severe physical debilitation. The crafting process entails weakening the subjects through starvation or physical trauma to reduce their natural resistance to the significant changes they face. The Vojd, among the most formidable type of ghoul, a titan of terror, created from the amalgamation of at least 15 ghouls, with some instances involving over 30. There is even an account of one formed from over 100 ghouls requiring six Zemishi to create. These behemoths are walking calamities, equipped with numerous fanged maws, bone spikes stretching six feet, and tentacles for ensnaring victims. Their sheer ferocity and rudimentary intellect make them nearly impossible to control, reserved solely for cataclysmic annihilation. Crafting a Vojd is an arduous, intricate endeavor, requiring the fusion of multiple ghouls into a singular behemoth. This macabre process involves melding their skeletal frames before encasing them in shared flesh and organs, all while continuously infused with vitae to endure the excruciating transformation. Achieving a collective blood bond among the constituent ghouls, followed by a ritual, either rooted in koldunic sorcery or advanced animalism, to unite their beasts into one, marks the culmination of their creation. Historically, the production of a Vojd was a seldom seen rite, known to a select few within the Zimishi, given the peril of managing such uncontrollable entities. Today, the knowledge and rituals required to spawn a Vojd are closely guarded within the clan, with only a minority of Zimishi elders aware of a few existing specimens. Revenant families are among the most interesting and varied type of ghouls within the Zimishi roster. They are mortals steeped in Zimishi Vitae through generations and continue to serve the clan with absolute devotion, assuming roles as custodians, consultants, warriors, and potential offspring. Revenants enjoy significantly prolonged lives, maintaining a profound bond with their lineage and the clan. These families are deemed invaluable for various reasons. They provide hospitality to nomadic Zimishi, serve as effective intermediaries in human affairs, and preserve the clan's history, which many fiends overlook. Although some within the clan view them as a potential threat to their secrecy, the practical advantages of revenants are indisputable. Moreover, their capacity for evolutionary advancement further elevates their significance to the Zimishi. In the modern era, four principal revenant families along with several lesser lineages persevere, with others either assimilated into larger families or eradicated. A few families are so despised that their names are whispered only in subdued tones. However, today, we shall discuss all of the families past and present to gain a deeper grasp on the workings of Revenants as a whole. The Basarabs trace their lineage back to the confluence of Dacian royalty, ancient Indo-European peoples settled in the territories now known as Romania and Moldova, as well as Roman legionnaires. 
They quickly set themselves apart from the other Revenant lines with their noble heritage and strategic prowess. Their bloodline was miraculously able to avoid the degenerative deformities common among Revenant families, preserving their status as a truly noble family. They held a position of near equal standing within the Sabbat to their vampiric masters, with their large influence and military might. However, their legacy was irrevocably tainted by the actions of one of their own. One I am sure you all know too well, Dracula. Born into the Basara line, he was ruthless in his quest for power and immortality, leading to the murder of several Zimishi and the diablerization of an elder. He would vanish from vampire society only to re-emerge and publish his life story as well as partially reveal the truth about vampires through Bram Stoker's Dracula, breaking the masquerade in a way no vampire has ever done before or since. His actions provoked a severe backlash and as punishment, the Zemishi would eradicate the entire Bazarab line. The few that survived were closely monitored and diminished in numbers, forced to interbreed with other families to survive, eventually leading to the complete extinction of their pure bloodline. The Bazarabs were renowned for their exceptional command over the disciplines of Dominate, Protean, and Vicissitude, leveraging these abilities to become legendary warriors and tacticians. However, they bore a peculiar vulnerability, a severe allergy to garlic, enduring even in death. This relatively benign affliction would nonetheless fuel human legends, suggesting that all vampires shared this weakness and further entwining vampire lore with mortal superstition. The Bratovich, known for their colorful and untamed lifestyle, characterized by their intense family loyalty, they share every aspect of their lives with one another engaging in communal acts that bond them tightly together. This closeness, however, has its darker sides, including incest, grotesque experiments, and self-mutilation, leaving many within the Sabbat to avoid them. They live in destroyed houses within the North American wilderness, with a few in South America and their homeland of Poland. They never clean their homes, or themselves for that matter, and rarely interact with anyone outside of their revenant family and vampires to the point of not understanding why others find it repulsive to murder or drink blood. Historically, they wielded significant power in feudal Europe, particularly in what is now Poland and the borderlands between Transylvania and Wallachia. They were known for their brutal rule over lands constantly at war, where the suffering of serfs was a common sight, as well as their role as faithful guardians and loyal servants to the Zemishi. Their most notable skill is their talent at werewolf hunting, having a keen understanding of werewolf nature and their strategies. During the Anarch Revolt, the Bratoviches initially sided with the Old Guard due to familial ties and deeply ingrained obedience to their masters. However, they skillfully shifted allegiances to the Anarchs when the political winds changed, ensuring their survival and continued influence by erasing any memory of their previous loyalty through the ruthless culling of their youngest members. In modern nights, though they no longer hold the noble status of the past, the Bratoviches remain indispensable to the Sabbat and the Zimishi. They are the keepers of hellhounds that serve as guardians or hunters for high-ranking Sabbat members. Besides their role as kennel masters, they also serve as guides and trackers, possessing unparalleled knowledge of avoiding lupines and excelling in rural manhunts. The distinctive disciplines of the Bratovich family, animalism, potence, and vicissitude, mirror their connection to their animalistic and formidable physical capabilities. Yet this wild nature is a double-edged sword, predisposing them to frenzies reminiscent of the Bruja clan's temperament. The Donislavs have a dark and tumultuous history. Initially, they were a noble family with connections to the Shadow Lords, a powerful werewolf tribe making the Danislav significant in the region of northern Transylvania. Their fate took a grim turn when they fell under the control of a Zemishi vampire known as Count Florescu. The Count's method of ensuring loyalty was both cruel and unusual, imprisoning them for the first decade of their lives, conditioning them into servitude. Despite their noble beginnings and initial loyalty to Florescu, the Donislav's allegiance shifted dramatically due to the influence of Grandfather Thunder, an incarna revered by the Shadow Lords. This supernatural entity empowered the Donislavs to overthrow Florescu and claim dominion over their lands, albeit briefly. 
Their rebellion, however, ignited the fury of the surrounding Zimishi lords, leading to a brutal campaign against them. In a final act of betrayal in 1399, a member of the Donislav family turned against his kin, leading to the family's near total destruction. As a reward for his betrayal, he was embraced into vampirism, carrying the Donislav legacy into a new, dark chapter. The Donislavs possess unique supernatural characteristics that set them apart from other revenant families. They have access to the disciplines of Auspex, Protean, and Vicissitude, but also can learn the gifts of the Shadow Lords, something rarely seen. However, their powers come with a heavy burden. Donislavs suffer from a weakness to Silver and Wolfsbane, traditional anathemas to werewolves. Like the tales many of you have heard about werewolves, the Danislavs frenzy during a full moon, becoming more bestial and unpredictable. Furthermore, their past rebellion has made them eternal enemies of their former Zimishi masters, marking the Donislavs as figures of both fear and hatred in the eyes of those they once served. The Grimaldi are a relatively recent addition to the Zimishi clan's roster of servitors and one of the most important revenant families in modern times. They were brought into the fold during the late Middle Ages as the Zimishi sought a merchant family to take in to expand their power. They were chosen over the Giovanni, another candidate, after carefully considering the Grimaldi's perceived uprightness and honesty as merchants, contrasting the Giovanni's reputation for deceit. A choice that would prove correct when the Giovanni would usurp another vampire clan in the near future. The Grimaldi's role was to bridge the clan with the mortal realm, leveraging their economic savvy as Europe transitioned into modernity. Now the Grimaldi maintain their influence within mortal power structures, holding sway in government, industry, and media, even able to compete with the likes of the Giovanni and Ventru. Rather than overtly claiming power, they often serve as advisors or marry into influential positions, mingling their blood with prominent families across the globe. This positions them as valuable assets to the Sabbat. The Grimaldi's primary duty is to conceal the existence of vampires from humanity, adeptly covering up potential breaches of the masquerade with mundane explanations or leveraging media connections to discredit truth as sensational fiction. However, within the family, there is a silent fear of the Sabbat and its sadistic teachings. Many worry that the Zimishi could abandon them at a whim and lead to the inevitable eradication of their family. To prevent this, many within the Grimaldi have secretly created alliances or made deals to defect should the need arise. Despite these challenges, the Grimaldi's loyalty to the Zimishi and the Sabbat remains strong, with each member being bound to a Sabbat authority ensuring their allegiance. With disciplines like celerity, dominate, and fortitude, the Grimaldi are formidable in their own right. Though they possess a weaker vitae than other revenants due to the nascency of their family. However, this does not detract from their strategic importance to the Sabbat or the Zemishi. The Kavi, also known as the Kazi, are a unique family within the clan. Created by the white god Bielobog for his own sinister purposes. Their existence was shrouded in mystery and secrecy primarily dwelling within the marshlands of the northern territories, navigating the Baltic rivers and coasts on skiffs. Unlike other revenant families, the Kavi seldom interacted with mortals except when necessities such as food or new breeding stock demanded it. The Kavi were distinguished by their striking albino appearance, with their skin constantly peeling and flaking, especially under the direct influence of sunlight. This physical affliction not only marked them as outcasts from normal society, but also as direct extensions of Bielobog's will and design. The exact methods employed to breed the Kavi remain a mystery, but it resulted in a revenant line that was profoundly odd, even by the eccentric standards of Zimishi revenants. The eldest among the Kavi, those in direct counsel with Bielobog, bore an even more ghastly visage, appearing as if they were afflicted with rot or plagued by severe disease. Despite their potent abilities and fearsome reputation, the Kavi line met their end at the Blade of the Teutonic Knights during the Crusades, exacerbated by a betrayal from within the Kazi that purportedly led to Bielobog's downfall. This event not only marked the extermination of the Kavi, but also served as a cautionary tale to all Zimishi about the perils of internal betrayal and the loss of a revenant family that once served as a cornerstone to the White God's power. 
The Kavi's inherent disciplines were animalism, obfuscate, and vicissitude, reflecting their master's dominion over beasts, their ability to hide from sight, and the notorious Zimishi flesh-shaping art, respectively. However, their unique weakness was their skin's susceptibility to sunlight, which caused it to flake and peel more severely, leading to painful rashes and impairments to their capabilities until healed. This vulnerability was a significant handicap, requiring them to avoid sunlight exposure to prevent debilitating damage. The Krevcheski, later known as Ducheski, are another traitor family and stain on the Zemishi legacy. Originating as scholars with little interest in the political machinations of Eastern Europe's noble houses, the Krevcheski focused on advancing their knowledge and understanding of ancient learning. Their expertise and fascination lay in the realm of clockworks and mechanisms, crafting elaborate devices both for defense in warfare and for more sinister purposes, including the torture and entertainment of their enemies. Their innovative contributions included siege engines for the Zimishi, showcasing their inventive brilliance. However, during the late stages of the Omen War in the Dark Medieval Period, the Krevcheski family's trajectory shifted dramatically as they betrayed the Zimishi to align with the Tremere. This pivotal decision marked a turning point, earning them the undying enmity of their former masters and necessitating a change in their family name to Ducheski. Despite retaining many of their customs, the Ducheski became rare in modern nights, with rumors suggesting the family line might be dying out due to their severed ties with the Zemishi. They are known to live in fortified and secluded homes, housing massive libraries, with two rumored locations in Poland and Kansas in the U.S. In addition, while they remain in relatively good standing with their premier masters, very few are ever embraced as the clan prefers to keep them in their role as servants. Despite these challenges, the Ducheski maintain their mastery over mechanisms, continuing to produce devices of twisted brilliance that served grim purposes. Ownership of a Ducheski torture device or system of alembics became a status symbol among certain elder circles, akin to possessing an original piece of artwork. The Ducheski's supernatural characteristics evolved over time. Initially, their family disciplines included auspects and dominate, a reflection of their scholarly and manipulative capabilities. However, their betrayal and subsequent alignment with the Tremere introduced thaumaturgy into their repertoire, expanding their arcane abilities. This shift was not without its drawbacks, as inbreeding among the Ducheski led to various birth and personality defects. The Obertus, also known as the Hidden, is a lineage of revenants deeply intertwined with the Zemishi clan. These revenants serve as clerics, researchers, and keepers of forbidden knowledge, dedicating themselves to unearthing and cataloging blasphemous secrets from ancient texts and artifacts. Their work often takes place in monasteries and libraries, where they preserve and study documents with origins as significant as the Library of Alexandria, meticulously maintained through centuries of history and relocation. Historically, the Obertus have served the Zemishi since the Knights of Constantinople, acting as monastic clergy and maintaining the faith that Byzantine vampires built around themselves. Their origins and how they came to Eastern Europe remain a closely guarded secret within the family. Surviving the early conflicts between the Zemishi and Tremere, they played a role in the Anarch Revolt, siding with the Sabbat against their elders and eventually migrated to the New World alongside the Sabbat. In modern times, the Obertus continue to thrive in quiet locations, diligently recording the history of their clan and the Sabbat, while also exploring the potential for Homo sapiens to evolve into Homo Obertus, a new species they believe embodies the next step in human evolution. They conduct experiments on the embrace and ghouling process, aiming to perpetuate ghoul existence without the need for vampiric vitae or the constant care to create a revenant family. Family members possess the disciplines of auspex, obfuscate, and vicissitude, with a unique weakness towards becoming easily obsessed with secrets, similar to the Nosferatu, treating this obsession as a derangement focused on particular types of knowledge. This obsession drives many within the family to delve into supernatural studies, investigating the curse of Cain, ancient genealogies, and various other arcane topics. The Oprichniki, 
have a dark and bloodied history tied to Ivan the Terrible's reign in 16th century Russia, originating as a secret militia named after Ivan's principality, Oprich Nina. They were notorious for their brutal enforcement of the Tsar's will, engaging in acts of terror, flaying and boiling alive those who opposed Ivan. Their survival through the Tsar's rule, a time marked by fear and bloodshed, where even the Oprich Niki turned on each other, speaks to the vile nature of those who remained. Post Ivan's reign, the Russian Zemishi, recognizing the Oprich Niki's potential for ruthlessness and loyalty, adopted them as vassals. They served the Zemishi in various capacities, from bodyguards to assassins, trained from birth for their roles. The fall of the Soviet Union has only loosened the Zemishi's reins on them, allowing the Oprichniki to operate more freely, albeit still shrouded in secrecy from much of the clan. They primarily serve Russian Zemishi and those associated with the Oradea League, benefiting from the relative openness of borders while remaining hidden from the broader clan's view. The Oprichniki are unique not just in their origin and service, but also in their supernatural affliction. They are haunted by the ghosts of their past atrocities, specifically the massacre of Novgorod, an act that left thousands dead or tortured and has since cursed the Revenant line. Despite their abilities in animalism, obfuscate and vicissitude, this curse manifests as a perpetual haunting, with each Opryknikki stalked by at least one vengeful spirit. Attempts to rid themselves of these ghosts only result in their replacement, ensuring the Revenant's eternal torment for their historical sins. The Vlazi were a fascinating lineage within the Zemishi clan's network of servitude. They were renowned for their exceptional skills in horsemanship and warfare, as well as their adeptness in the realms of statesmanship. Originating from Hungary, the Vlazi expanded their presence throughout the old country, often found in border fortresses guarding the most volatile frontiers. Unlike many other revenant families that served the Zemishi out of fear or subjugation, the Vlazi's allegiance was driven by a sense of honor and duty to repay a significant favor once granted to them by the clan. The exact nature of this debt was a closely guarded secret known only to the family's eldest members. However, we do know that each member was bound to a Zemishi by blood oath upon adolescence. While they followed their masters with the utmost loyalty, Many had open disdain for their servitude and the actions it demanded. During the Anarch Revolt, the Vladzi were among the few families to side with the elders. As a result, they were butchered down to the last member of the family, all but disappearing in modern nights. The Vladzi family was gifted in the disciplines of animalism, potence, and presence, a combination that complemented their martial prowess and social influence. Unusually, they possessed no inherent weakness save for their blood oath. As the Vlazi remained staunchly committed to an ancient vow of service, honoring a pact to support a clan for which their affection was anything but straightforward. The Xantosa, initially known as Xantovich, are a revenant family of Eastern European noble origins deeply intertwined with the Zemishi clan. Historically, the Xantosas held significant power and influence leveraging their wealth and cruelty to maintain their status until the Zemishis declined during the Omen War. Despite this setback, they adeptly shifted their loyalties to the Anarchs and subsequently to the Sabbat, expanding their reach across Europe and serving as vital informants against the Camarilla. Today, the Xantosas have embraced hedonism, engaging in activities ranging from global travel and participation in the drug trade to involvement in slavery. This shift towards indulgence masks a dangerous secret tied to the Zemishi Antediluvian, which, if revealed, could jeopardize their standing within the Sabbat. What exactly this secret is, is unknown. However, I speculate that their allegiance has shifted to the Zemishi progenitor acting as its eyes and ears, and luring unsuspecting victims into its waiting jaws. While some Sabbat members disdain interactions with humanity, the Xantosa's ability to navigate and exploit human vices makes them invaluable. Their parties and social gatherings attract influential mortals, providing discreet indulgences that secure the Xantosa's as indispensable allies. The Xantosa's are adept in the disciplines of auspex, presence, and vicissitude, which empowers them to effortlessly charm their way through social circles and adapt to any situation as needed. 
despite the family's evolution from noble guardians of Zimishi interests into purveyors of vice. They continue to produce neonates not just for the Zimishi, but also for other Sabbat clans, reflecting their adaptability and enduring significance within the sect. The dependence of the Zimishi on these families goes beyond mere convenience. It's a calculated strategy that cements their power and ensures their survival through centuries. For hunters, it's easy to think that these families might be far flung, concealed, or far from your doorstep. Yet their significance cannot be overstated. They serve as the conduits for the Zimishi's reach, weaving their presence into the fabric of both the supernatural and mortal worlds, orchestrating events from the darkness to execute their agenda worldwide. For those hunters daring to take on the Zimishi, understanding the scope and function of these familial networks is key. Their ability to adapt and persevere, refined through ages, challenges us as hunters to be equally ingenious and alert. Before the Zimishi clan came to be known for its creation of revenants, Schlachta, Vojd, and other ghouls, there existed the Bogatairi, elite warriors who served the eldest with a loyalty fierce and unyielding. Unlike any human, werewolf, or vampire, these champions claimed origins from the mystical Meru Mountain in India, boasting near invulnerability to physical harm. Stranded in the Carpathian Mountains by the cataclysmic Great Flood, they pledged themselves to the eldest. In battle, the Bogatairi wielded not just weapons, but their own bodies transformed by the dark gift of their master. They carried with them skin pouches within which rested a fragment of the antediluvian's very flesh. This sacred relic granted them the power to morph, taking on the fearsome aspect of the eldest himself, arms becoming lethal blades, tongues sharp as spears. However, their era of dominance waned with the defeat of the eldest at the hands of Samuel. Following this cataclysmic event, the Bogatairi scattered to the winds, their purpose lost, rumored to be an eternal search for their vanquished lord. Despite the survival of the eldest through his progeny, they did not reassemble. However, there have been rumors, sightings of these elusive beings. Some believe that they are guarding the many proxies of the eldest scattered throughout the globe. The truth of these remains to be seen. Yet should these guardians indeed walk among us, they represent a power formidable and ancient, a reminder of a bygone era when gods walked the earth. The Zemishi embody many traits most of you probably associate with a traditional vampire. The origins of this archetype, and more precisely the architect behind it, is something we shall discuss later. Traditionally, Zemishi have resided in the iconic castles nestled in the Eastern European mountains, known for their exceptional hospitality to guests within their domain. This trait remains a cornerstone of their identity, while not universally observed among them, especially among the younger members, who show less regard for ancient customs. Their culture is rich with traditions, including a set of hospitality rules that, while varying by region and individual, are broadly recognized within the clan. These customs ensure that guests are granted three days and nights of shelter and protection from external threats, a pause in any ongoing family feuds, and access to the finest accommodations available, potentially even the host's personal quarters. However, such privileges are not extended lightly. Visitors are expected to bring gifts or offer services upon arrival or departure. Respect the host's space and belongings. Avoid causing offense to the host and their family and adhere to the three-day stay limit unless explicitly invited to extend their visit. During the Dark Ages, adherence to these laws was critical among the Zemishi. Any breach could lead to severe social consequences, including loss of honor and widespread ostracism within the Zemishi community. This system of hospitality was designed to prevent exploitation on either side, with these exchanges typically occurring between Zemishi themselves. However, Zemishi hospitality is not extended to most. Within the circles of kindred society, they are infamously recognized for their intricate and merciless torture techniques. This penchant for causing pain is not merely a hobby, but a deeply embedded aspect of their culture. Zemishi are known to ensnare mortals, subjecting them to agonizing torment for years, often seemingly without any specific reason. Their expertise isn't limited to inflicting physical pain. They excel in the psychological realm as well, leveraging their vampiric abilities to unearth and exploit the innermost fears of their victims.
Being masters of the blood bond, they can manipulate current blood bonds to force victims to inflict pain on those they care about, or force a blood bond onto a vampire to alter their emotions to a permanent state of fear. The origins of their sadistic inclinations are largely a mystery. It could stem from their obsession with the physical form and their unique ability to mold and shape flesh at will. Pushing individuals to the brink might serve as a twisted form of research, aiming to uncover new possibilities of physical transformation. Whatever the case, falling into the hands of a Zemishi is considered one of the most dire predicaments imaginable. The Zemishi clan, alongside the Ventru and La Sombra, is counted among the so-called rulership clans within vampire society. Each clan embodies a distinct approach to leadership. The Ventru adopt a direct, commanding presence. The La Sombra prefer to manipulate events from behind the scenes. Common to both Ventru and La Sombra is their use of the disciplines of dominate or presence to exert control and consolidate their influence, employing mind control as a key strategy in their governance. Unlike their counterparts, the Zimishi have traditionally lacked access to these disciplines, leaving them without this particular method of direct mental influence. However, their leadership style is no less effective, characterized by a reign of fear and intimidation. The Zimishi skillfully employ their unique disciplines to inspire terror, achieving a level of control over their domains that borders on the omniscient. We will delve much deeper into their disciplines later, but it is important to understand how a Zemishi can utilize their powers to instill fear. Through the discipline of Auspex, the Zemishi are adept at detecting even the slightest hints of dissent. This heightened sensory perception enables them to eavesdrop on distant conversations and identify potential threats early on, allowing for swift and decisive suppression of any rebellious activity. The clan also cleverly utilizes its progeny as spies, who infiltrate mortal societies to monitor and report back on public sentiment, leveraging auspects to uncover secrets and quash the seeds of insurrection before they can sprout. The discipline of vicissitude serves a dual purpose, acting both as a means of punishment and as a method for disguising themselves or their agents. This ability to alter physical appearances ensures that Zemishi and their spies can move undetected among mortals, fostering an atmosphere of paranoia where no one feels safe. Animalism further extends the Zemishi's surveillance capabilities, allowing them to witness events through the eyes of animals. This indirect form of observation permits them to monitor their lands while remaining unseen. Smaller creatures in particular prove invaluable for infiltrating tight spaces or covering vast areas quickly. There is a reason that while the clan's reputation and territory are constantly declining, the individual powers within the Zemishi continue to thrive and excel. Their dominion is not upheld through military might, but through a pervasive culture of fear and psychological manipulation, rendering the distinction between conqueror and subject irrelevant. In modern nights, the survival rate of newly turned vampires is remarkably low, with most not lasting beyond 10 years. There's a myriad of reasons for this, the advent of the Second Inquisition being a large one. But many lose their life due to the struggle with their inner beasts, or lack of deeper knowledge about their condition. Among those who manage to endure, a select few seek understanding and control over their vampiric nature through various paths or tenets believed to temper the beast within. These paths of enlightenment or resistance against the beast are varied, ranging from those who find revelation in death, pursue the ideals of Cain, and offer themselves in service akin to medieval knights, to others who delve into darker pursuits such as demonic pacts. Each approach represents a different strategy for coping with or transcending the vampiric curse. The most prevalent among the Zemishi is known as the Path of Metamorphosis. The Path of Metamorphosis, followed by those within the Zemishi clan, is a journey towards a state of being known as Aji Dahaka, representing not a merger with the universe, but a complete detachment from it. Achieving a divine, self-sufficient will, the true pinnacle of adaptation that the original Zemishi sought after. This pursuit is solitary, with many on the path of withholding their knowledge or even misleading others due to paranoia or ego. The path emphasizes physical transformation as a precursor to spiritual enlightenment, with practitioners often employing the clan's fleshcrafting abilities to modify their bodies 
in pursuit of greater efficiency, adaptation to their environment, or even to mirror esoteric and divine forms. The ultimate goal varies among metamorphosists, with some denying the existence of the soul, viewing vampirism as a liberation of flesh, while others see the soul as a summary of the body, aiming to evolve their physical forms to adapt perfectly to their surroundings, including the modern urban landscape. Their practices range from extreme physical alterations to exploit the vampiric condition, to eschewing mortal blood in favor of vampire vitae, each believing that their unique approach will bring them closer to Aji Dahaka. The diversity of these practices reflects the individual's struggle to define and adhere to the tenets of metamorphosis, making it a path of personal discovery and transformation that is as varied as the practitioners themselves. There are deeper shadows to explore regarding these monstrous entities, but those tales will wait for another time. For the moment, understand this. Our adversaries are legion, their roots entwined with the very foundation of our world, a malignant growth that threatens to consume all. They are entrenched, their influence spreading further and deeper than we can imagine. Yet it is our duty, our solemn vow, to confront this darkness. We must excavate this blight from our midst, lest it suffocate the very essence of what we strive to protect. And prevail we shall, for the strength of our resolve is mightier than the deepest roots of their corruption. United in purpose, we stand as the beacon of hope against the encroaching darkness, a testament to the enduring spirit of those who seek to preserve the light. Stay vigilant, fellow hunters. 